The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open the word of truth to Romans 7, verse 5. Romans 7, verse 5. All right, once again, as is our custom at Maranatha Church, is to give believers an opportunity to be sure that they are in fellowship. Uh, God has provided for us this wonderful way of spiritual recovery from being under our sin nature back in fellowship so that we can appreciate the plan of God as we are studying here the uh, particulars with regard to uh, the sin nature and our new opportunity in Christ to uh, put aside, as the Bible says, lay aside these things. How do you do that? Someone might say, oh, you just quit doing them. No, you have to confess your sin and that's laying it aside. Obviously, you should move forward with better application, but you are gonna sin, you are gonna fail. Every day, you're going to commit some kind of a sin more than once. That's why you have rebound, it works. You gotta use it. So if you need to use it now, do so. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your mercies are renewed to us each and every day. We thank you for the grace that we have in Christ and for the understanding of how to tap into it as believers. Bless this Bible class to our encouragement and our orientation to your plan. All right, in Romans 7, we saw we saw, we're, we saw the analogy that Paul sets up uh, using the analogy between one woman and three men. The first man is the law. The law, we are born into the world and we are in a way, in that sense, married to that fact the need or the necessity of producing plus R. We can't do it. And so the situation with the first husband is that the woman, humanity at large, humanity cannot live up to the requirements of the Mosaic Covenant, which requires plus R or else. And that's uh, what we have been studying in Romans is that as human beings, we cannot come up with plus R through our own efforts. It's not, it's not feasible, possible in any way. So, married to the first husband, the woman <clears throat> rebels because he requires perfection and she aligns herself with the second man in this analogy. The second man is the STA, the old man, the old self. And so she has a illicit relationship with him through the function of personal sinning and being designated an adulteress, which equates to fact that we are sinners, locked into our STAs. Now, for that portion of the human race, there's an alternative to end the stigma of an adulteress, to end the stigma, and the third, the third man that some members of the human race are married to, following my anal the analogy here, is Jesus Christ. All right? And that's, uh, but in that regard, the illicit lover is still in the picture. The law isn't, but the illicit lover is. 
relationship to the STA. Now, that, that was broken momentarily when you became a believer. The STA was checkmated. It was no longer, the, for a moment, it was no longer the ruler of life. But for a lot of us, being in fundamentalist different types of churches, we weren't told this. This was kept from us. They might even admitted that we sinned, but they did not explain the fact that we are indwelt in our genetics with an STA or our old sin nature or whatever term uh, synonym under that, the general doctrine of the STA. We weren't told this. We were, it was not explained to us. And so we just muddle along thinking, oh, I got to do better. Not realizing that you need to carry rebound in your hip pocket, so to speak. You need to access it continuously because you're going to sin. Worry about something, get mad about something, uh, let guilt eat you up. Uh, all the other things, mental attitude, sins, and all the rest. The illicit lo lover is still in the picture if we allow it. But the second husband is tolerant of this fact to a point in that he recognizes we're going to sin and we're going to need to use rebound and reestablish a relationship with God experientially. That's the Christian way of life. All right, old state, new state, verses five and six. For while we were in the flesh, when we were, this is an imperfect, the imperfect looks at, the, the imperfect active indicative looks at things linear in the past. Hence the translation were as in past tense. While we were in, and we have the definite article with the noun sarks, which is the word flesh. Now, of course, flesh is used in the Bible in a lot, in different ways. Like the matter that covers our skeleton, that's flesh. That's, how, that's, the, that's it. But this is used in a technical way for being in the sphere of the STA called here, and notice in your doctrine, one of the synonyms for the, fle for the STA is the flesh. Paul says, in my flesh dwells no good thing. What's he, what's he talking about? He's talking about the resident STA in the genetics of his body. That's coming up later in Romans. While we're in the flesh, the sinful passions, uh, the word passions is pathema. It's also used as a word, as it's one of the synonyms for, for suffering in the Bible. But here it's used for passions, comparable to lusts, the passions of the STA. It's translated sinful passions, but it's the passions, and you have the genitive with the definite article of hamartia, the Greek noun for sin. The sinful passions, this is consistent with what we have, were aroused. Those, they were uh, aroused. Uh, the word aroused, imperfect active indicative, because we're dealing with the pre-salvation period, imperfect active indicative, in ergeo. This word means basically to be operative. So this is kind of a colorful translation, which, uh, uh, so which, we'll chat, which were, uh, okay, let me back up. The sinful passions, which were, and we have, have a definite article, uh, neuter plural, nominative, uh, it means those through law, through the law, with the article, which were by the law, they put the word in italics, aroused. I understand why they did that by the law, were at work, were operative in ergeo. We have our word energy. Again, notice the imperfects in this part of the exegesis. 
because it's dealing with past time, were operative in the members of our body, the bodily parts involved in uh, sinful activity, in the members of our body, <clears throat> to bear fruit, bear fruit is an infinitive, aorist infinitive, to bear fruit, karpothoreo, to bear fruit for death, definite article, thanatos. Now, this is, this is Paul's theology. This is his understanding. It's what he's inspired to write. This isn't going to be one of those like friendly verses that people are going to make, immediately appreciate. No way. You've got, so that's the, that's the first part. The new state. But now, the conjunction, but, duh, now, the adverb, but now we have been released from the law. We have been released. Aorist, passive, indicative, cot argel. And I will add the requirement of the law to produce plus R. We've been released from that requirement to come up with plus R, an impossible thing, of course. We have been released from the law. In all, in all these instances, the law refers to that, the epitome of God's revelation of his righteousness, the Mosaic Covenant. We have been released from apo, the law. Having died, uh, having died, Aristarchy participle, apothenesco, to die, having been, having died to that by which we were bound, which, the relative pronoun, hos, which we were held fast, caught echo, were bound, so that, uh, a purpose clause, so that we serve, that's the present infinity, so that to serve, duleo, to serve, uh, in newness, kai noi teis, in newness of spirit, numa, and not negative, and not in oldness, pi siotes, oldness of letter. Huh. All right. While we were in the flesh, point one of course, refers to our time before salvation. He's writing to the Romans and, and letting them reflect on before they became Christians. Refers to our time before salvation when we were dominated by the sin nature. Carrying on, to carry this over, with the second man of the analogy of the woman and the three men. Carrying on with the illicit lover. This, while we were still married to the first husband. He's applying what we saw in the analogy here. Flesh is a very common synonym for the STA in the New Testament, as this indicates or suggests its makeup, genetically engineered, and location in the cells of the body. That's where the sin nature is. Sin nature is not in the soul. It influences the real you, the soul, but it is not in the soul, it is in the flesh. When a person dies, they leave that behind. The flesh and its rule generates sinful passions. As noted in the exegesis here, uh, passions, uh, and it's actually the noun and the nominative, passions, plural, with the word hamartia, with the article in the genitive. Passions of the STA, of the sin nature. But we'll leave it, leave it like this. It's not, it's not misleading. To have it as sinful passions, as if this was an adjective with passions. It's not. And its rulership generates sinful passions. And these lusts, or these passions are further stirred up 
by exposure to the first husband, the law. She rebels against him. She being the humans, the law comes along. It doesn't slow people down. We've already covered this in Romans. It doesn't, it doesn't slow down the person in the unsaved state. And also, well, I'm not there yet. We won't be there until verse 20 of chapter 5. The law came so that the transgression would increase. The coming of the Mosaic law and its presence with humanity did not diminish STA behavior. That's the first, that's verse 20. We might have expected otherwise, but it's not what we get. The STA is stirred up by the you shall not defining sin. The STA is stirred up and so there is actually an increase. And in 616, uh, second. Six sixteen. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? Okay, but the primary verse there is five twenty, which documents an, an interesting fact that the coming of the Mosaic Law did not suppress STA activity in the human race as might be expected. It further stirred up the STA. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is the manifestation of God's perfect standards of moral conduct, of proper conduct, but it stirs up the STA. There's like this antinomianism is fired up. Paul is going to say it even stirred him up. We get to it later when we get into this chapter. So once again, he tells us that the sinful passions, lusts of every kind, were operative in the members of our body. We saw it in 613, where believers are enjoined not to go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. There's your deal again, resulting in further lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And we will see it in 723, where Paul applies this to his post-salvation condition as a believer. This not, might not be encouraging, but it's the way it is. He's talking about himself as a believer. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. He's talking about getting out of fellowship on his part. And his STA is fired up. And it drags him into at least mental attitude sins. This is the conundrum that the believer lives under. The, the, this, there is no absolute solution for eliminating sin in the life of a believer, but there is a way to begin to win the battle and to gain an upper hand, and that's getting Bible doctrine in your soul, but then you've got to apply it. You've got to be smart and realize this isn't to my ultimate advantage to go be running around here under my sin nature and pandering to my lust pattern or anything else with regard to it. The whole point of all this is to bring to our attention the power of the STA. Your STA never really sleeps. It's always there, operative, trying to push you in a certain direction. The lust pattern is the perfect way to illustrate it because of the power that is in it, that people, people are doing things and they're motivated by their lust pattern. 
Approbation lust. We see it in kids. We see it in adults. Leading to boasting and other factors. Approbation lust. Oh, look at me. Center of attention type stuff. Then, of course, we're all familiar with monetary and materialism lust. Who hasn't ever lusted after some materialistic detail of life? Ooh, look at that. It's common. We, but you can look at things and not get all worked up under your STA. Get in fellowship and ob observe things objectively. That's nice. It's attractive. But you don't need to be obsessing and lusting after it. And then, of course, there's sex lust and power lust and approbation lust. I gave that one. <laughs> Probably even wonder lust. I just got to be on the move. I got to be going somewhere. I got to be doing something. You know, rolling stone. Can't, can't, can't settle in one place. Got to always be running around like some people. Doctrine helps you to overcome this, but you have to make application. So this includes mental attitude sins. A mental attitude sin is a sin. Jesus said this. He taught this. He says, if you look after a woman and lust after her in your heart uh, as a married person, you commit a mental attitude adultery. We'll rebound it and move on. You don't have to do anything overtly. <clears throat> this includes mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, and overt sins. That should be overt. <laughs> Eight. Death refers to the perpetuation of spiritual death with its condemnation during, the period, during that period in our lives, here in this verse. To bear, we're at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death, with respect to death. We did things, a lot of different things. Ephesians 2.5 Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us, he, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. This constitutes a break in the cycle. The break in the cycle comes with the salvation adjustment. Inner, third, uh, third man, second husband. So before salvation, we were held fast by the first husband and his demands all the while we were involved with the second man. So in verse 6, Paul states the situation as of our salvation as release from the law. Now he's going to come up later in these verses, and I don't want anybody to get weird ideas here that the law is bad and we can just run amok now. No, that's, that, that isn't the point. We have been released from that requirement. The requirement to produce plus R, and we can't do it. It's impossible to uh, maintain or gain that kind of righteousness. You'll have that kind of righteousness when you go to heaven and get your resurrection body. You'll be, you, one of the, the attribute of God that you will have in common with God is his holiness, his righteousness. You will be absolutely 24-7 free of the STA and any inclinations. It's hard to imagine, but that's the way it's going to be. In time, what we, what we do is we rebound or we resist temptation and apply Bible doctrine. In verse 6, Paul states the situation as of our salvation as release from the law. What does that mean? Having died to that by which we were bound. This is all the subject, the theological, doctrinal subject of all of this. That salvation is, in order to have it, you have to have plus R. There's two sources. One's an impossible source. Remember in the early part of the thing, if the first husband dies, she's free? 
Okay. But he only dies for the individual when the individual becomes a believer in Jesus Christ and we're released from the requirement of law to crank out plus R. 100% to gain God's approbation and eternal life. If you thought Romans was going to be easy, you were mistaken. So the law has no jurisdiction over us in respect to experiential, that's temporal, perfection, to earn plus R. Has no hold over us. We're free from that. Thank God. We, got, we get plus R by grace, by believing in the one who died for the sins of the STA. That's how we got our plus R. That's how the only way you can get plus R, as a gift based on faith in Jesus Christ. On your best day and your worst day, you've got plus R. That's your guarantee that you're going to be uh, on the positive side of the afterlife. <clears throat> so in that sense, in that sense only, the law has no claim to perfection over us. When Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, you can imagine what people have done with that one. <clears throat> you're not going to be perfect, but you are perfect when you're in fellowship. Oh, and by the way, coming up, when you are in fellowship, you're keeping the law. Remember that in the thing, that one infraction of the law breaks the whole thing down. One infraction. You don't have to do all the sins uh, that are in there. You just have to break, you just have to do one sin. And the whole thing. And that's what Moses illustrated when he broke the tablets. When they were practicing idolatry. And of course there's associated sins with that little episode at the foot of the mountain. So it's kind of amazing, isn't it? How stupid believers can be? Well, Moses didn't come down in their mind in a timely fashion. He went up there as per the demand. And 40 days was too long to wait. They all freaked out, got under their STAs, started worshiping what they'd been worshiping down in Egypt, uh, the Egyptian Hathor, cow god, and a big, and a big uh, hell-raising event occurred at the foot of the mountain. And Moses came down to witness that. These are believers. Now, I always like to illustrate from the Exodus generation. It's amazing, isn't it? So I, it, it, it encourages me that, that no matter what God does through and in his leaders for the witness of people, they're still going to act up if that's what their inclination is. That's exactly what they're going to do. No amount of evidence can change people who are so predisposed. Nothing. Nothing. All, the, all that God did through and in Moses, you'd think, I'm listening to that man. I'm following him 100%. No, the majority, the majority, the understatement, the majority rebelled in the desert. Believers rebelled. And they paid a price. And that was, they didn't get to go to the promised land. They all died in the desert. All the adults that came out of Egypt, 20 and up. They all died in that desert. Sin unto death. You'll meet him in phase three. They're all believers, as far as I know. The majority, anyway. Great majority of them. They were all believers. They trusted him. They trusted in Yahweh. They believed in him. They put the blood on their doorposts and their lentils. And the, and the, de and the death angel passed over and didn't take out their firstborn. They, they saw all these things. They saw all these signs. And they rebelled against their niche. What is their niche? What well, was initially plan A, two years living in tents in this, in this, in this wilderness. And, I'll give you, and God gave them everything they needed to support their, 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 their physical beings and their spiritual beings. Food every day. Water. There's a verse that says their shoes didn't even wear. Their sandals didn't even wear. And they did a lot of walking. They put a lot of wear and tear on their footwear. 
None of this mattered to these people. The next test, they went nuts and rebelled. You brought us out here to kill us and our kids. You're only half right. It was a prophetic statement. No, he didn't. His plan wasn't to bring any of you out here to kill you. He ever demonstrated that because he brought all of them out of Egypt and it says not one person fell by the wayside. You think some old feeble person would have made it. God gave every one of them the strength to make the, to make the trip on foot and get across that Red Sea and get on the other side. And they can look back and say, Egypt's trashed and, and Pharaoh's, Pharaoh is just a memory. We're going to the promised land. And the, the original plan was two years in the wilderness, but they got penalized because they flunked all their tests, all 10. The last one was the straw that broke the cam camel's back. And God says, I swear by who I am, not one of you will enter this land. Except two men, and I'm assuming their family, their wives, Joshua and Caleb. They did not do this. One out of, what's the odds? One out of 600, two out of like 600,000 males plus that came out of Egypt, there's a census. There's a number in Exodus. I think it's 603,000 something. And so, these are the ones. Today, as a believer in Jesus Christ, get your eyes off of the mass of Christians out there or those who have left here. We've got more than two. Or two families. That's the way it is. It might be shocking that you get down to the church age and get at this point where there's so few and uh, I don't know everything that's out there, obviously. Since we have plus R by faith, point 14, the law can no longer demand plus R of us. We have no connection to that first husband. He's dead and gone in that sense. Now we're related to, once again, the challenge of our new status is expressed in the purpose clause so that, as it is in verse, in verse 4. Okay. To so that purpose clause. So that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. Enter husband number two. Husband number two dies too, but it's a positive thing because he's raised from the dead so that the woman, the believers in Jesus Christ, might bear fruit from last night. Divine good production. The Bible has a lot to say about divine good production. That is what you'll have in addition to your body and soul, from this life. It'll be brought over and brought to your attention as rewards. Newness of life refers to the dynamic of the indwelling Holy Spirit and all that he does for us as we serve God in phase two. What all does he do for us? Well, he indwells every believer permanently. We are filled with the Spirit when we're in fellowship. He reveals Bible doctrine to our positive volition. And there's a whole setup for that. It's called the local church under a pastor teacher. There's his sealing ministry. We are sealed. That's the doctrine of eternal security. And every believer has at least one spiritual gift. Here and in 6.4, Paul uses the noun newness of life. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father so we too might walk in newness of life. That's the emphasis on the Christian way of life. This new spirituality is not in oldness of the letter. Meaning that attaining the filling of the Spirit is not by a legalistic approach as is taught in certain religions. 
make amends, you got to do X amount of good. You don't. You just rebound and re reset yourself. All right? Well, I'll see you. You uh, hang in there. Don't let anyone take your crown while I'm gone. Be back. And uh, we're praying for everyone in need. Uh, if you have any special need uh, with regard to prayer or anything else that you can't handle yourself reasonably, let us know. Uh, contact one of, a, one of the uh, leaders of the church or whoever, and uh, we'll uh, come to your aid. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen.